Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This episode number 107. In this episode, I interview Brandon Rust. He has been gardening for 20 years and is the owner of Bokashi Earthworks. Some of you may remember Brandon from episode 16 of this podcast, where he talked all about utilizing microorganisms in the garden. In this episode, he talks about several different garden amendments, why they would be applied, and the pros and cons of using them. There is now a separate channel called Garden Talk Clips on YouTube, where these podcast episodes are broken down into highlights or smaller clips. Simply search Garden Talk Clips on YouTube and the channel should pop right up for you. I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring free information about gardening all plants to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to Mars Hydro for sponsoring this episode. Check out their spring sewing sale, which is going on right now. They're doing 15% off some of their LED grow lights, such as the TS series and SP series. They also have 2x2, 3x3, 4x4, and 5x5 complete grow tank kits on sale. They also have other items. So go to their website at mars-hydro.com and you can use the discount code MrGrowIt for a discount on any of their products. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. My entire ventilation system is AC Infinity. I have their inline fan, ducting, carbon filter, and their controller. I love the Controller 69 Pro with temperature, humidity, and VPD programming and having control of different fan speeds. This makes it so much easier to control my grow environment. Their Controller 69 Pro version also controls their oscillating fans, grow lights, and humidifier. The discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today, I am joined with Brandon Rust. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing good. How are you doing yourself? Doing good, man. Thanks for asking. So this is your second time on the podcast. The first time around was episode 16 back in May of 2021. So quite a while ago. You talked all about utilizing microorganisms in the garden. And uh, there was so much great information in that episode. And it got over 63,000 listens on YouTube alone. So that's nuts. <laughs> You've definitely touched a lot of lives in that episode. In this episode, we're going to get into various garden amendments, why they would be applied, and the pros and cons of using them. So really excited for this one. Uh, but first, can you introduce yourself for those that didn't catch the first episode we did together? Sure. For any of your listen listeners who aren't familiar with myself, my name is Brandon Rust. Um, I specialize in agronomy and microbiology for medicinal plants, uh, but I also, you know, work with people who do food production and all, you know all types of uh, other types of agricultural crops. Um, I own Bokashi Earthworks, and we have a couple of different things that we do at Bokashi Earthworks. So one of the things that we that we are ramping up and and starting to do on a larger scale is our green waste recycling program, where we take organic waste from other industries and we convert those into. Uh, biological fertilizers through a process of salt state fermentation. We might have touched a little bit about that on the last episode um, that we did together. Uh, we also manufacture a product called Micro Plus here in Oklahoma City um, at the uh, office. And that is a consortium of microorganisms, uh, fungus, yeast, and bacteria that is used for bioremediation, for nutrient cycling, pathogen suppression, has a bunch of different applications in across agriculture, remediation, and even uh, it is used in livestock industry as well as a probiotic. Um, and we also sell uh, bulk soils uh, amendments and humate fertilizers that were developed by NASA Agricultural Technologies. And so we have a lot of different aspects. We just opened up our Bokashi Earthworks Learning Center where you can actually come in person on our scheduled days and you can learn about different subjects similar to what we're doing now. While we're doing, um, we're gonna be talking about organic amendments. Uh, we have classes on solid state fermentation. Uh, different uh, practical applications uh, of 
you know, microorganisms uh, in gardening. So we have a lot of different things that we cover and we'll be making more schedules and more events as the year progresses. We'll also have guest speakers uh, such as uh, Dr. Pepper Hernandez and some other people doing some K&F classes as well, some natural farming classes. So we kind of bundled everything together because I the biggest hurdle that I found when it comes to breaking into conventional agriculture is the education is, is greatly needed uh, before people will put their faith in doing something new, especially when it comes to, you know, when we're talking about the American farmer, one of the things that a lot of times they face is the fact that a lot of these people are actually mortgaging their land and their property to get the things that they need to be successful. And so they always typically go with what has worked in the past and they, that's been replicatable because their livelihoods are on their line. On the line and if something goes wrong they could be out everything um, their whole family their whole their family's livelihood and their business and everything so it's one of the things that a lot of people don't understand about how you know American agriculture works but uh, they they do a lot of uh, labor uh, not a great return and a lot of times they're putting everything on the line to do it so we have to make sure that the people who are switching over to these types of programs really understand the way that they operate and the practical application that's behind the science so that way they can achieve the success that they need to be profitable and maintain uh, a sustainable agricultural model. I like that you not only have good products, but a, a big focus of yours is the education. You know, you're, you're not shy and holding back information, right? You're trying to educate the community and that's a big deal. You know, not a lot of people will be open to that. You know, they just want to sell their products and that's it. They don't really care about the education side of things. I mean, just going on your Instagram alone, I know before we start recording, you had mentioned that you're not able to really keep up with it as much as you like, but there's a lot of great information in regards to the science behind the plant and things that can be useful in the garden in order to grow these plants successfully. So I'll definitely have a link to his Instagram down in the YouTube description section below. For those of you tuning in on YouTube, highly recommend you give him a follow because there's great information on that channel. All right, so getting into the topic. So you gave me a list of amendments prior to recording here. Um, I want to ask to begin, are all these amendments that you're about to talk to organic or are some synthetic? Okay, so let's talk about what organic is, first of all, because there's uh, some mis understandings about organic versus synthetic so you could have and and also natural so in most people's minds when they hear organic they are thinking about a practice you know using things that are naturally uh, around them things that are sustainable and that I consider you know uh, natural farming where you're using where everything is pretty much organic but here's the thing what organic truly means is carbon based so if you were to approach any any institution any type of scientist or anything else and you're talking about organic it means that it is carbon based now some of the things that we use in agriculture don't contain carbon but they are natural things like gypsum for instance which is calcium uh, calcium sulfate now it's a natural compound. It comes right out of the earth. There's an abundance of it. It's it's easily accessible and it doesn't have any negative impacts on the environment when it's uh, applied correctly. It you know even and and also I want to make sure people understand just because something is is considered organic doesn't necessarily mean safe either because there are things that are organic that are also. Um, they're not safe, you know, or if you're over applying something, it can still have a detrimental impact to the environment or uh, people around you. And so when we're talking about organic in this context, we're talking about both meals. Those are usually your organic inputs. And then you have things that are natural, like your rock minerals. And then you also have natural salts like Epsom salt. That is a natural occurring mineral and it is a salt and what a salt is it's just a it's a cation an element with a negative uh, with a positive charge attached to an anion 
which is an element with a negative charge. And what happens is it just means that negative and positive attract, and so they, they've attracted, they've created a covalent bond. It's not a very strong bond, and so they disassociate in the presence of water. And so when we're looking at something like gypsum or copper sulfate or iron sulfate, there's, these things are natural. They come from the ground. They are not synthetically produced. So the difference between organic and natural, so we're using things that are organic and natural. We're not using things that are synthetically created, right? Like um, that come from the, the Herber Bosch process of creating nitrogen from, from gas. Right, so there's just, and then, you know, some of the synthetics, if you were to talk about like DAP, diammonium phosphate, right? You're essentially mixing uh, ammonium and phosphate. And what the way that that would work is you would take a, a natural mineral element that contains phosphorus, you're attacking that parent appetite material with something like phos uh, like with a sulfuric acid. And what that does is it releases the anion that we were mentioning. That phosphorus anion from that parent ap appetite material liberates that and they're able to separate that out. Now they take that phosphorus and then they mix that with the ammonium that was made during the Herbert Bosch process and they get, you know, monoammonium or diammonium phosphate. Now those things take a lot of energy and resources to produce. That's why we're looking at these and going, hey, this is, may not be the best way to do it because of the, the resources allocated to the production of those things. They're not in, and also, like if they're used properly or if they're, you know, they have less of a detrimental impact, right? And so, the, but the problem is that even when you create something like diammonium phosphate, which has really high nitrogen value and a really high phosphorus value, those things are both biologically mediated, right? Naturally in systems. And so as soon as you put that down, you're gonna lose nitrogen immediately because it, 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 it goes through a process of, that is mediated by biology and, and some of that can off gas back into the atmosphere as atmospheric nitrogen. Some of it will be leached away. It's got a very low nutrient use efficiency. So even though you're putting high uh, numbers on there, maybe like 42% uh, phosphorus in this case, not all of that is gonna be available. What happens is as soon as that is liberated, both of that, that cation from the ammonium and that anion from the uh, phosphorus, those are liberated. And so now you have a highly, highly reactive anion that doesn't stay in that form freely in nature for very long. And so what it does is it's, it, it attaches to other uh, positively charged particles in the soil. And so it can tie up things like iron and calcium and zinc and manganese. It can tie up these, these other elements, making them unavailable to the plant. And so you're essentially, you're, the thinking is, oh, I'm adding in a bunch of this mineral nutrient, but what you're actually doing is you're causing a chemical reaction when those things disassociate and are liberated within that system where they start to tie up other things, making the things that were already there that were available become unavailable. And so there's a bunch of chemical reactions that are happening and there are biological um, reactions that are mediated during these processes. You know, carbon, phosphorus, sulfur, nitrogen, and iron are all very, very highly biologically mediated in these soil systems. And so we have the nitrogen cycle, we have the phosphorus cycle, we have the carbon and sulfur cycles. And then iron is a whole different beast in itself when we're talking about the natural acquisition of iron into the plant is because iron you know, uh, it, it, it oxidizes so rapidly in, you know, the pH ranges that these plants are usually optimally operating in. And then also in the presence of water, because it's, it's ox the water is an oxidizing agent. And so it, it, it gives off its hydrogen ions to that ferric iron and cause, and causes it to oxidize into Fe3 plus, which isn't really available to a lot of plants. And so with biology, you can have things like the, the production of amino acids and sediophores that can keep that iron in a metabolically available form. So there's all these different nutrient interactions that are happening. And so when we're talking about synthetics versus natural, um, we have these anions that are in great abundance 
that start to tie up stuff, but also they acidify the, the organic matter that's already there, causing a reduction in the amount of total organic matter. And we need, you know, about 5% is ideal for, for, you know, ideal crop production and for these biologically mediated processes to be able to continue to happen. And the, the less percent that we go under that, the less biological mediated processes are happening. So we have to add continuously more and more and more, and it just compounds the problem over time. And so when we're looking at things that are naturally derived or organically derived, we still have to look at the application rates. We still have to be responsible in the timing, the when, the what, the uh, and the why, or the when, and uh, and the and the where. You know, we have to be mindful of the application still. However, these things are usually uh, less uh, resource dependent, and they're also less energy dependent, and then they're less environmentally impactful, or, or they don't have an environmental impact that's going to be negative. They usually, will have a positive environmental a aspect to it because with an organic amendment like a meal, and we'll divide these up, we have meals which are going to be a slower release. You'll get some nutrient availability right away when you apply those, but things like alfalfa meal, soybean meal, blood meal, uh, bone meal, uh, guanos, those types of things, they'll take a little bit, up to three or four weeks to be completely broken down. Now, so that those are all organic. And so when we're talking about organic amendments, I'm usually talking about meals specifically because those are a carbon-based organic substrate that actually takes the breaking down of that material for whatever's in there to be released into the system and become metabolically available for the plant and the bacteria uh, and fungi in the soil. Then, then there are the rock minerals that you have things like calcium phosphate, azomite, um, you have uh, you know, glacial rock dusts, you have those type of things that are usually going to increase your cation exchange capacity, your ECE of your soil. It's usually going to bring in some type of calcium source, some type of phosphorus usually, and then trace, trace minerals. Um, and then you have your natural salts, right? Things like Epsom salt, gypsum, um, oh, also step back, uh, in those rock minerals, we also have things like calcium silica and also uh, liming agents that will help with pH. Then we get into natural salts, Epsom salt, gypsum, which is uh, calcium sulfate. We have all the mineral sulfates that are all naturally occurring, potassium sulfate, uh, and then all the micronutrient sulfates. And then also for boron, either borax or uh, solubor, which is sodium borate, which is another naturally occurring salt. And again, these things aren't detrimental in, in the systems, but you do still have to be mindful of what you're adding in because you're looking for sufficiency, but you're also looking for balance between all the elements. And so uh, the difference between all of those elements is that three to four weeks on the organic meals Usually you'll have uh, some mineral availability in the rock in the rock minerals, like you know calcium silica. You'll get the silica and calcium. A, a nice portion of that is available, and then you have your salts. Salts are all immediately available, and so what happens is they disassociate when you put them in water. Some of them will react. Uh, with other elements so that's one of the things that you need to be you know mindful of if you have a, if you have a cation it's going to be attracted to an anion so that's why the sulfate the sulfate is the anion in all the mineral sulfates and then all the rest of them are all cations so whether it's zinc copper manganese magnesium or calcium they all have a sulfate uh, state that they can be in those disassociate in water and they're metabolically available right away. So you can add Epsom salt, gypsum, and all your you know iron sulfate. One of the things that you can do when you're adding these into your system is you can add humic and fulvic acids and that'll help them uh, stay in a metabolically available form. Because just because they are available, 
they change. Things change in real time, right? Some things will bond with this. The plant will take some stuff up. Uh, you know, some of the biology will use it and mo and uh, immobilize it to the for the plant, and then it'll be in the you know, and then that'll, that'll have to cycle to be released again. So, a bunch of different stuff happens. But out of all of those natural compounds, the the mineral salts uh, will always be more available you'll always have a higher availability that's interesting yeah i'm glad we went over this first because it's definitely going to be helpful as we go along here because we're going to be talking about salts we're going to be talking about meals and so on and so forth so let's start going down this list now calcium silicate talk to us about that one of my absolute favorites so calcium is a is a it's considered a secondary nutrient but for a lot of medicinal plants and a lot of heavy fruiting plants uh, calcium will actually uh, be about second or third as far as the amount that it'll store in the tissue and the amount that it'll actually uptake calcium mediates so many different aspects this particular element is it works really really well to stabilize pH. So if you have a low pH, it is, it's not going to have as fast of an acting time to increase. It's not just going to make it jump up from like, you know, 5.5 to 6.5. It's more of a slow jump. So it, it's not as fact, fast acting as something like high calcium ag lime or even something like dolomite lime, which will jump it up a little higher, uh, faster. Um, but the benefit is that you get the calcium and the benefit of the silica as well. And although silica is not considered a, a, an essential plant nutrient, it's as it's not needed to complete the plant's entire life cycle. It's kind of something that really aids in a lot of other aspects that I'm not going to get too much into. But yeah, it's a it's a rock mineral, so some of it will be available. The majority of, of it will be cycled through different processes through the biology and the soil. And it's one of my favorites to actually front load uh, calcium early in the vegetative state when plants are really starting to you know fill out and put on the the green foliage and everything else. And it helps with a lot of different things like chemical messaging uh, signaling it helps with um, you know really thickening up thickening up the the the, the cuticle layers uh, on the the leaf surface which can help as a protectant from leaf eating insects and then it's also responsible for uh, helping with you know uh, the movement of other elements so it's really important another calcium uh, source that we would use and this one is actually a salt and so it has more availability right away is gypsum or calcium sulfate it's one of the other go-to mineral elements that I use to get adequate levels of calcium and there are a couple of other things too that I'll use for calcium but the calcium silicate and the gypsum are the number are are are, are the, the first when we're talking about calcium because the other elements that we're gonna talk about that have high levels of calcium on, in them also have phosphorus and some micronutrients that are associated with them as well. And so in the instance that I would not want to be adding in any more phosphorus, if I had a plenty of phosphorus I didn't need to bring any in or uh, I didn't want to bring any other elements in and I was strictly addressing calcium I would only use the gypsum or the calcium silicate um, now bone meals that is going to be an organic amendment it is a, it does have carbon in it and it also has a lot of calcium and a lot of phosphorus so in, in the instance that I needed to implement and get both phosphorus, or maybe I didn't need phosphorus really, but you know, my, like my, you know, it's, it's not going to hurt because it's an organic meal to add that extra because the way that it's going to be broken down is going to be really slow anyway. So it's not 
going to have an extreme impact on other elements in the soil or the soil biology. It's not going to set anything out of balance with like a bone meal. Um, unless you're using something like a fish bone meal, which you could bring in too much and you have sodium, too much chloride because it's just an ocean input. So bone meal is really good calcium source. You'll also have the phosphorus associated with it. There's some other stuff too that also has calcium, but you should be careful with. And that is going to be high phosphorus seabird guano. And typically what people are using that for is for phosphorus. It has a high availability of phosphorus and it, it's pretty quick to release. Even though this is an organic uh, substance, so you can get the phosphorus in there a lot faster with that with the guano but you also have to remember that if you're already loaded up on a ton of calcium already it's it might not be something that you would want to add as your phosphorus supplement simply because it's probably going to have something like 18 to 23 percent calcium also associated with it and when you're looking at a label like a plant label you have a part on there that has your npk right and your calcium and magnesium and all that stuff isn't all, isn't always going to be on there it might be listed on the back if it's listed at all and so from a consumer standpoint if you know about your npk and you're trying to address something just for phosphorus you're inadvertently adding something that you may not want to be adding so it's important to know exactly what other elements are associated with the mineral amendments or the organic meals that you're using. Now, in regards to bone meal, there's some controversy behind it, right? It's kind of like a not the best source to use. So I think you're talking about it being a byproduct from the slaughter industry. And the, the same can be said about things like blood meal. But the, this, is, this is the issue. Those industries aren't going to stop. You are. People are going to continue to eat meat. Yes, we should strive for ethically sourced and we should, but that comes with our dollar. That comes with the buying power of the consumer. So that is, that falls on the consumer to, you know, uh, get their meat from producers who have ethic treatment of animals. That being said, it, you know, all of the waste that comes from any industry if it were not recycled and used for some other purpose, it's just going to go to waste. And so the it's there there there's a conflict, right? Okay, so there are producers and I'm not using like that we get our all of our bone meal uh locally. So we know where it comes from. And what it's not like these giant desert cattle farms that exist in like New Mexico and stuff like that. These are all, uh, you know, Oklahoma and, and Texas. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a product uh, uh, that's being recycled for, for, and repurposed. And so it's kind of a double-edged sword when it comes to it. Because, yes, we need ethically sourced. We have to, you know, obviously. Um, if we're not using the byproducts, though, then they're, then, then they're going to waste. So, you know... It's going. The, these industries exist, it, and they're they're going to create byproducts. Whether or not you buy the, that type of meat or that type of product, that's personal preference. I know as a company, uh, and I'm into organic waste recycling, that we're going to take waste from the industries that we operate with because we want to close those carbon cycle loops we want to get that carbon back into soil we want to uh, promote regenerative farming systems and we want to be able to do things in a manner that is less detrimental to our our environment and to our own selves you know so but yeah you're right it, it is it is it's one of those things you know you might not want to buy products if that's that's the case but then but you have to look at where the products are coming from where they're sourced from and so we've done our we do all of our due diligence when it comes to all of the inputs that we use um, when it comes to both our soil our compost and all of the things that we that we sell to our consumers 
Understood. All right, let's move on down the line here. This next one I actually have in my garden and I use it quite a bit from time to time, which is magnesium sulfate, aka Epsom salt. Talk to us about that. Oh, it's a good one. It is, out of all the mineral sulfates, it actually has the highest solubility. And so uh, um, a little goes a long way. And typically when it comes to, you know, medicinal crops and even heavy flowering fruiting uh, crops, if you're doing, like for me, when I do all of my home grow stuff, I love to use magnesium sulfate as a foiler spray. You know, I like to use a tablespoon per gallon, and the reason is this: because it's really, really soluble. You have uh, you have four major soil uh, cations. It's going to be calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. We always want sodium as low as possible, um, but all the other three, all those four things, they're antagonistic to each other. So they need to be in balance so they can be absorbed by the plant in the right ratios. And when we're talking about Epsom salt, it's very soluble and it can cause antagonisms with calcium and potassium. So we over applying it through a soil or through watering it in, unless you're doing what I do with the agronomy and you're doing soil analytics, doing soil, uh, soil testing, saturated paste testing, leaf tissue testing and whatnot. If you're just a home grower, you can kind of avoid that situation that you might put yourself in by locking out some of that other stuff with, by over applying too much, right? Because you don't, you might not know how much you need to be applying. If you just use it as a foiler spray, you can avoid that. So you can avoid that negative chemical interaction that would happen within the soil, those antagonistic uh, relationships that could could potentially be there with the misuse and you can just use a tablespoon per gallon and spray it on the plants and it's going to have great great efficacy now one of the things i do have to mention that whenever you're doing a foil uh, uh, an application using a spray you need to start with clean water something like reverse osmosis or distilled water because if you're not using clean water you could have a lot of sodium or a lot of bicarbonate or your ph could be you know really really high and so it decreases the efficacy of what you're trying to apply so when you're using clean water you have a greater efficacy you know the plant's not uh there's not any kind of negative reactions uh, antagonisms that are actually happening because the water you know has high you know boron in it or this or that or whatnot you know so tablespoon per gallon is a little bit different for me i used to use a teaspoon per gallon so it looks like i need to up to up my dose a little bit there i always use as a, a foiler as well and you can do it a couple times a week even too. You can go and spray and one day, wait another day, spray again. Like it's – I wouldn't recommend doing more than three times a week. But that is a really, really great way. And one of the things that I see pretty consistently across the board and uh, your leaf margins, so they'll start to show a little shadowing in between the veins where there will kind of be a slight discoloration. That's a very verse, that's not the very first sign but the, the leaf petiole will actually start to turn purple. That's a good sign. So if you start there, you can do your foiler sprays and you can kind of avoid all that. And the thing about magnesium is it's a photosynthetic element. So at the center of every uh, chlorophyll molecule is going to be magnesium, right? So you need it for chlorophyll, for the plants to, to photosynthesize. So it, it, it can be a really limiting factor, especially in veg. If you do not have enough magnesium, everything else is going to slow down because your plant doesn't have the ability to photosynthesize or create more chlorophyll in the, in the chloroplast. And you're never doing a foiler and flowering, is that right? Up to about um, week two, you can, you know, during the bolting. But I, I try not to spray anything uh, after we've had, like, you know, flower sets. The last thing that I spray is usually around day 21. I'll do, a, I'll do my, my pruning on my plants that need to be done, bottom, prune up all the stuff, whether it's, you know, medicinal herbs or even, you know, tomatoes and stuff like that, peppers. You, I prune all that stuff up, all that crap on the bottom so the energy is at the fruiting sites. And I'll spray trichoderma and bacillus subtilis as a combination and 
it has so many benefits. It has benefits as a soil drench, but as a foiler application. That's the last thing I spray, and that's usually for the prevention of things like botrytis and powdery mildew in crops. It helps suppress any type of leaf-borne pathogen, and then it also works as an endoph endophyte. So it will uh, penetrate inside of the plant cell, and it will help fight off any other type of pathogens. So we're basically what we're doing is we're inoculating the the plant um, endosphere. Uh, and the uh, the phylosphere uh, to basically outcompete other pathogens and kind of give that extra layer of protection. Endophytes are super interesting. That's that's a whole nother episode itself. Oh, yeah. We get really deep into that, but it's, um, it's really, really cool. Yeah, dude, dude, the way that microbes work, when you start understanding actually understanding microbial metabolism and like what photosynthesis is, right? Because there are a lot of different uh, microorganisms that photosynthesize. In fact, photosynthesis in plants came from bacteria that, that combine with their cell. I mean, if we're looking at uh, chloroplast, right, they have their own sets of DNA and cells. And so they replicate independently of the plant cells themselves. And so it's, a, it's, a, it's an ancient function of a symbiotic relationship that became encapsulated into one system. It's a very, very fascinating. And when you're looking at microbial metabolisms, whew, we'll, we'll have to do that one another episode. Uh, magnesium, you don't want uh, too high a magnesium actually going into flowering also. Remember, it's a photosynthetic element, and so if you have too much, it'll actually decrease your, just like nitrogen, it'll decrease your, your cannabinoids, it'll decrease uh, terpene expression, so it can have some negative impact on some medicinal herbs while on some other herbs it'll have positive impact, like on tomatoes, you're going to have uh, you know better... Uh, health benefits if you have more magnesium, more calcium, stuff like that. So it depends on which specific crop you're growing that these that these things, um, they're situational, you could say. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't know that one. Okay, let's move down the list a little bit further here. Uh, we are at soybean meal. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so we'll get, let's talk about both soybean meal, alfalfa meal, um, blood meal, Feather and feather meal. These are all nitrogen sources. They're used pretty much for nitrogen sources. And while they do contain small amounts of, of other elements, typically we're not addressing, you know, we're not going to address iron with soybean meal. We're not going to address calcium with soybean meal. Although they have small amounts of that in there, we're looking at these specifically for nitrogen. These are nitrogen inputs. There are also uh, biostimulants like. Um, amino acids that can be categorized into an organic amendment as well. Uh, however, that's more of a biostimulant and it has much more beneficial properties than just the meals themselves. And they operate a little differently on the plant's metabolism. And so when we're talking about any of these, these meals, they all take typically between three and four weeks to be completely broken down. So you get some solubility of nutrition when you're applying it, but it's a slow release. And you can, and by week four, the majority, you know, I think for blood meal and feather meal, it's three weeks, 100% release of, of that. You know, if the blood meal was at 14% blood meal, and you put it in a pound of it, you can figure out what the PPM of that is by, you know, doing some mathematical conversions. And you can figure out, okay, so I'm getting this much PPM of nitrogen over the next four weeks. And so you can kind of, that's how I know how to do my application rates as far as when I'm looking at agronomic data and giving people personal recommendations for their crop. And... Each one of those is a different one. You know, soybean meal and alfalfa are going to be, um, they're going to be plant-based, right? And they're going to have a slightly lower nitrogen content than, than the animal-based products, like the feather meal or the blood meal. Um, those are going to have a higher nitrogen value. The, the uh, soybean meal... I really like that. That's one of my go-tos. That is like one of my absolute go-tos. It's about 7% nitrogen, and it has about three and a half week span to where it will be completely broken down. It, it, 
offers a little bit of a difference in comparison to something like blood meal because the blood meal will have higher ammonium uh, concentrations in it as opposed to the uh, soybean meal which has more complex nitrogen source like amino acids. It has amino acids associated with it or nitrogen that hasn't been broken down fully while the blood meal will have a it has a higher nitrogen content and a higher amount of that nitrogen content is going to be in its ammonia uh, ammonium form which means it's going to be m more readily available so when you put that in it will have way more solubility than the other types of meals like uh, soybean or the or or alfalfa meal. Alfalfa has a, actually a really really small, usually only one maybe two percent nitrogen associated with it, and it has a slower release as well. So that might be a total release of maybe like seventy five percent over a four week period of time. Now, what about kelp meal? Would you group that into that same category or or no? No. If you look at if you look at kelp meal. And this is one of the things I absolutely do not use kelp meal. I, after all of the research that I've done, kelp meal is a no go, and this is why. Uh, at, at when I've looked at maybe twenty different brands, uh, suppliers of kelp meal, there is only one single company, and that is Espoma, that has low arsenic. Okay, so across the board, kelp is notorious for. For arsenic contamination, um, Espoma had like 1.37 ppm. All the rest were between uh, uh, 20 to 30 percent uh, ppm parts per million of arsenic. And now, so that's a great concern, especially when we're talking about commercial uh, production of food or medicine, especially in you know medicinal herbs. Um, we we we're, we're testing. We we get you know we have to test these products, and that can be a huge problem for commercial cultivation. So, and then if you look at the actual nutrition of kelp, if you're looking at the NPK, it's usually less than one percent across the board. We might have one percent nitrogen. You might have half of a percent or 025 percent phosphorus, and maybe half a percent potassium. The amount of kelp that you would need to add into a system to bring that system to nutritional sufficiency would be exponentially more detrimental because of the high heavy metals, the high sodium, and the high chloride content. Because all kelp has high sodium chloride, sodium and chloride, because it's an ocean input. In all ocean put inputs, well, there's oyster shell, crustacean meal, fish bone meal. All those things have higher uh, sodium as uh, associated with them. And so when you're adding a bunch of kelp, if you're trying to add it in there to bring these systems, oh, I need to, my NPK levels up. It's not an adequate source of those to bring it up. And then the amount that you would have to bring in, you would detriment, you would, it'd be detrimental to that system. That's one of the things that we're talking about. Just because something's organic doesn't necessarily mean safe or doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to have a positive benefit. The cons for kelp for me and the people that I work with and consult with, the cons outweigh the pros is what I'm saying. So there's more native impact as associated with using kelp. Now, the thing that most people will say, oh, I want to use kelp for the, the phytohormones, the things like the, the oxen, which is endoacetic endo acid, or the cytokinin, or the gibberellic acid, or the trace mineral elements. Well, you can find most of those trace mineral elements in most of the organic meals, like I was talking about before. Blood meal, bone meal, feather meal, they all contain trace mineral elements. Your compost contain trace mineral elements. And then we also have, and if you're looking strictly for like um, a phytohormone input, the, the, the benefit from plant hormones, I use Kiaha. I use cold-pressed Kiaha, not the dehydrated but the cold pressed and that's because the kiaha doesn't have any of the negative associations with the heavy metals the sodium the chloride but it does contain all the bioactive compounds the organic saponins it contains all of the cytokinins gibberellins and 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 um, endoacetic acid as well as a bunch of other things like amino acids 
So there are you take different approaches, and I know which approaches work best for the practical application of these things. Now the science, most of the science will say, oh, kelp works wonders, kelp works wonders, but most of these things are done on just regular food crops, and none of those food crops are being tested. You know, what's, what is the, the end result? You know, what are the metals levels content? What is the actual mineral nutritional value of these? So we can get biostimulating effects from a lot of different things, including microorganisms. And so I take just a different approach when it comes to kelp, and that's my reasoning behind that. Understood. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the cytokinins, the hormones, auxins, because you hear about people using kelp specifically for those reasons. So I'm glad you got into, uh, into that one. Our cold-pressed kiaha is actually sourced from regenerative farms down in Chile. And it is – now, if you were to look at the comparison of like the other products that are the dehydrated products, the, they have a higher um, content of saponins because there's – everything else has been extracted out. With our product, we have 8.6% saponins, which is – very high, but it's also all of the other bioactive compounds and the diversity of those saponins. So you might only get maybe um, like 70 or something like that with a dehydrated product. And then with a cold pressed product, you'll get something like 114, 115 saponins. Huh, that's interesting. Up next, let's talk about potassium sulfate. Yeah. So potassium is a interesting element in the fact that the plants need it in abundance. It is a macronutrient. It is a. It's responsible for the opening and closing of the guard cells. It is responsible for sodium ion pumps for you know diff, uh, to make diffusion work across cellular membranes. Um, it's it helps with water transport because it it you know those guard cells on the stomata they open it up and allow for transportation of nutrients and water throughout that system potassium is responsible for for that system it's got a bunch of different things that it does however these things potassium comes from um mineral mineral appetites usually comes from minerals right and it is not typically in abundance in you know, uh, conventional agriculture soils, outdoor soils. Most of the land that we see uh, isn't really super fertile. Like you, you would have to remediate it before you could uh, grow crops, or you have to use fertigation techniques and crop covers and add carbon, whatever. Um, so when it comes to potassium sulfate, it is a mineral sulfate. It's a naturally occurring uh, mineral that allows us to get that much needed element really quickly when we need it now there are a couple of different things that i use for potassium now potassium comes in in a couple of different ways typically in soil so composts it comes in composts and not in huge quantities we're usually maybe two three percent potassium when we're talking about compost and those are all slow release now we, potassium I see uses is, is is probably the number two element, um, especially in high, in heavy fruiting and medicinal plants, heavy fruiting for vegetable varieties. I mean, we need a lot of it. It needs a lot of potassium. A lot of these plants do. Um, so we can get it from potassium sulfate. Another another one is potassium silica. Is, is what I like. Is another thing that I use, which is um, the trade name Agsil sixteen. It's essentially uh, potash and sand heated up really hot together it's mixed together and we'll, and it's a water soluble form of both potassium and silica and monosilicylic acid in that form so it is a available form and a very it's the least expensive form of silica so if you're using uh, a silica amendment this is by far the most cost effective way to get silica in it has uh one it, it's got 32% potassium by volume so you can use small amounts to get the potassium that you need and it is water soluble so you can mix it into a fertigation tank and water it in you can also foiler apply Agsil 16 potassium silica um, and it works really really well because it it changes the pH of the water it makes it really high so if you're using it as a foiler application it'll change that it'll temporarily change the um, 
the phylosphere of the plant, which a lot of pathogens don't like that, so it can be used as a fungicide in that respect, while also adding the potassium and the silica, which is uh, available to the plant as a spray as well. The potassium sulfate, it depending on how much it's processed and what i mean by processing is they'll they'll micronize it they'll grind it up so you can get it in chunks and the benefit of having chunks is that you can get it as a top dress and just kind of leave it in there as your top dress and as you water in it'll slowly release over time when you have higher granulars also if it's a granular form of potassium sulfate and you're using that in like a soil mix the benefit is that it, it'll be a slow release but it'll also add pore space and so that'll help with you know water penetration throughout that soil system if it's a granular it also comes in fully water so water soluble uh, form so that way you can add it to a reservoir or you can water it in. And again, because it is a mineral sulfate, it's going to be metabolically available. So you can use this to quickly adjust levels. Like, So if I were to get a, a soil test back and I saw that somebody's potassium was low, my go-to is usually going to be potassium sulfate or axyl-16. There are other things that contain uh, potassium like green sand right I've seen people try to use green sand as a potassium amendment but the problem is this the release of potassium for green sand is so slow we're talking about you know several months to years for it to become available so while it does add some component of aeration and a very very small component of potassium it's one of those things that is is almost just like an extra that you could have in there if you wanted to and it's not going to hurt it's not going to really affect anything but i can't but it's not something that i could you know recommend as a you know as an agri as an agronomist and say hey this is what you should be using to try to get your system back into sufficiency because it just doesn't add the amount that's going to be needed to bring it up in an adequate amount of time. Another another a mineral amendment that we can talk to talk about is sulpomag, also known as K-mag, also known as langbanite. Now, it usually has around twenty two percent potassium, right? But what they're what what you're not typically looking at is on the back of it, it also contains sulfur and magnesium. And the problem with langbanite is that the magnesium and that sulfur are way more soluble in this when they're in the system, either as a top dress or if it's been, you know, if you've, you know, tried to mix it with water, let it dissolve. The magnesium in there, if you're trying to address just potassium, you have to remember potassium and magnesium are antagonistic. So if you're deficient in potassium, you go add sulpomag or langbanite thinking, hey, this has got 22% potassium, it's all gravy. You just neglected the fact that you added in 9% magnesium that is pretty much 100% soluble. So you have this partially soluble 22% that's going to be slow released over the next couple of months versus this magnesium that you just added in, jacking up your magnesium levels, creating more antagonisms between the magnesium and the potassium. So you could actually be thinking you're putting in a potassium amendment when what, what you're doing is actually uh, making it less available for the potassium that's already in there because you just jacked up the magnesium and you didn't need magnesium. That's crazy. Yeah. There's a lot of growers that reach out to me that they're tinkers. They like to add things in as they see fit and they're throwing off the balance, the overall balance. And they're really getting into hot water there because sometimes it's hard to get back in balance in that case, right? Do you have any tips for, for that? Yeah. So what, what I'm typically looking at, the, the, there are some major things and the, the three major things are going to be sodium, bicarbonate, and chloride. So bicarbonate will antagonize all of your cations, calcium, magnesium, iron, uh, just everything, you know. And so it makes it so that way you, the plant has to work way harder to get what it needs. So even if you have sufficiency and everything is balanced in there, if you've got really high bicarbonate levels, it's going to drive down the ability for the plant to uptake those nutrients. The same thing can be said with sodium. 
when sodium levels get higher and higher and higher, it causes osmotic stress on the plant. The plant actually, and then and then if you have events where you're drying out your soil, well then your ECE spikes and your and you have all of this oxidation occurring of all your mineral elements. It's it it's not conducive to plant health, right? It causes a lot of osmotic stress. It causes issues with with all the other nutrient interactions and then chloride 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 is an anion and high chloride will also negatively affect those types of elements that are anions phosphate nitrate um molybdenum so there's sulfur also one of the things that you have to look at is sulfur sulfur can cause osmotic stress as well and so if your sulfur levels are too high and they can especially if you're using a lot of mineral sulfates and so I, you know, I'll change up the mineral sulfate. Sometimes I won't use gypsum or potassium sulfate at all, and I'll use calcium silica and axil-16 because if my sulfur level is already high and I go ahead and add those in, I have to be mindful that I'm also adding a certain amount of sulfur into that. Sulfur is an anion. It's used to help with charge balance. It's also used for protein production. It's used for oil production. It's used for a lot of different things in the plant. And you need it. It's a photosynthetic element as well. So, but when you dry out, that sulfur causes ECE spikes. The electronic uh, conductivity of the soil, it spikes up and cause issues with osmotic uh, re uh, pressure. And then also, it can have some negative impacts on other anions like phos phosphorus and uh nitrate you mentioned sodium and bicarbonate and that's uh it, I, that's the reason why i can't use my tap water here where i am is because we're looking at uh, about 80 ppm of sodium and it's real high in bicarbonates as well so ph is high so i'm not even i can't even use my tap water i have to filter it i've been using reverse osmosis but that's another area where i think a lot of people kind of neglect looking at is they don't actually have a what they don't get a water test so they don't even know what they're, they're, they're using to begin. And then they're adding in these amendments along with their water, and it's jacking everything up. Yeah. And so what happens, too, is it's not necessarily going to be an issue the first round, the second round, the third round. But what happens is a lot of times these problems are com compounded over time. And so you bring sodium a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit until it adds up to a point where someone's like, dude, I don't know what's going on. I can't diagnose the issue. I haven't done anything different. My regiment's the same what's going on and it's and that the first thing i do when i go to a consult is say hey you guys need to make sure you're testing your water i don't care if you're using ro city water well water it all has to be tested and we'll test if you're on a well we'll test your well water we'll test your ro water we're gonna see if we even need ro right we're gonna see if if we just need specific filters because we're not trying to waste money either you know we're not trying to waste water we're trying to be as as environmentally positively uh you know, we we want to we don't want to create more issues. We don't want compound problems. And it's the same thing with kelp. You know, oh, what's happening? I've, I'm starting to fail for arsenic. Well, it's come to a point where that arsenic finally built up in, into the soil because you kept bringing it in with certain products. You know, you can you can mediate that, but just knowing, you know. But the thing is, home growers aren't they they're they don't test. You know, they're not testing and. Uh, commercial facilities a lot of times don't test. It's very, it's it's very seldom that people are doing what I'm doing in the industry that I work in. When it's pretty standard practice across all the rest of the agriculture industry, you know, whether you're growing corn or soy or ornamental flowers or tomatoes, there's agronomy and data involved where we want to know how much of what we need to use so we don't over apply and so we keep nutritional sufficiency and balance. Heavy metals is another area where we could do an entire episode on if we wanted to. I've been learning so much about heavy metals recently and um, it's, and they're it's scary. They're complex. Yeah. They're complex too, the way that they work. But we'll save that for another episode. We do have time for a few more of these amendments to go over. I know you got the list in front of you. Is there ones you want to kind of pick out that you'd like to talk about here? Yeah, we can kind of uh, we can kind of put all of the micronutrient sulfates all together in one, which would be iron sulfate, copper sulfate, zinc sulfate, manganese sulfate, and then sodium borate. Okay. These are these are all natural natural salts. 
and they're using extremely, extremely small quantities. And when I mean extremely small, I'm usually talking about one third to a half. And you know, the the most that you would do is maybe like three teaspoons per yard of soil. So we're talking about for every, you know, 650 pounds of soil you have, we're talking about, you know, maybe half a teaspoon. You know, for something like sodium borate, to bring that to sufficiency for several runs, you could put in point, you know, point three three of a teaspoon or one third of a teaspoon into one yard of soil and know that you're going to have enough boron and that you're not even have to address boron for that for the remainder of of your 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 grow this is kind of the same thing with with zinc and copper and and manganese the amounts that you use are so low that it's actually hard to use them as a top dress right so typically what we're doing with these micronutrient sulfates is we're distributing them evenly over the soil surface using either a spray application or by watering it in so uh, let's say i have a yard of soil and i know hey i'm going to be using a five gallon i'm going to use five gallons for this yard of soil so i'm going to mix my nutrient sulfates into this yard of soil with my humic fulvic acid and then i'm going to water this in so i have an even distribution of all of these micronutrient sulfates um, but when we're talking about like if you started off with zero micronutrients copper uh, uh iron you're going to have a little bit more you can put in about a cup and a half to two cups per yard of soil but when we're talking about uh let's say zinc you'll you could do two and a half teaspoons for an entire yard of soil that has nothing been added to it as far as a micronutrient and you are going to be sufficient and that will give you enough sufficiency to go for several runs as long as the biomass that you're pulling off like your leaf material and stuff is getting recycled back into your system now if you're taking all of your biomass out of your soil system and not letting that cycle back naturally you're going to have to add more sooner with copper you can do the same three and a half teaspoons for an entire yard of soil will bring you up to nutritional sufficiency for a while for a long several cycles manganese sulfate you can do two and a half teaspoons and bring that up to sufficiency sodium borate is half of a teaspoon borax just regular borax would be twice that amount or one one teaspoon and then you don't have to do it anymore and you could even if you were to take those and start off with nothing and stretch those out over a six month period and be like i'm gonna add one milliliter of this one you know it's like those ratios right there are solid and will get you know get you to nutritional sufficiency so a little goes a long way with those micronutrient sulfates yes and unless you're talking about the the macronutrients or secondary nutrient sulfates like potassium calcium and magnesium Right, because calcium sulfate, magnesium sulfate, potassium sulfate, you usually use a little bit more. Those are in the cups per yard. Like I might do, uh, you know, half of a cup of magnesium sulfate if I was deficient. You know, it, does, I, I, it depends. You know, it depends on the target, the data. But I'm always just looking at the data and saying, hey, this is how much is missing. This is how much needs to be added. Got it. I think we have time to squeeze in azomite. You want to talk about that a little bit? Or? Yep. So azomite is one of the amendments that I don't currently use anymore. Uh, I have found that it doesn't contain enough of anything to realistically be of any use. That's what I found about it. It says it has A to Z micronutrients and minerals, but when we're looking at a sufficiency perspective, the amount of azomite that you would have to bring into a system to actually have the right amount of calcium or manganese or zinc or that other stuff is just not there it just doesn't exist so but there are things that are associated with that have been associated with azomite such as heavy metals and aluminum that could have detrimental impact on the soil so this is one of those things where for me the cons outweigh the pros 
So I don't see a, a big benefit if I wanted to add in a type of rock mineral. I'm looking at it from a, what perspective. Why am I bringing in this rock mineral? Do I need to increase my ECE? Do I need to bring in calcium? Do I need to bring in phosphorus? Um, all my micronutrients are covered because I have micronutrient sulfates and I have also meals, organic meals that contain those things. So it's more of just like a luxury thing. If you want to add it in, you can. I don't recommend pump like relying on it for anything in specific because it's not going to do one specific thing. It's just kind of a luxury item to have that you could use. And I always go with the less is more approach. Right. If it's not something that I don't – if I don't have to spend extra money on it, if it's not necessary, I'm not going to, especially not at scale because all of those additional costs, they all add up. And as a small business and as a farmer, all of those additional costs are, are something that we could have put back into our pocket at the end of the day and used for – you know, to take the family on vacation, you know, get some much-needed R&R or you know, to – get the tractor repaired or get the tools that we need to, to be successful. So I'm always looking at this from a really cost uh, analytical perspective, and that's actually the reason why I got into organics because I did hydroponics for 11 years, and then I switched to soil, and I was using chemical synthetic fertigation salts, and it wasn't until I needed to find a better uh, business model how I could reduce my costs that I really started to look at all of the inputs and that's the biggest thing as a cultivator there's so many products on the market and one of the classes that we're going to be doing and we'll have that live on page on our patreon is going to be I'm going to have the people that come into the class bring stuff in from their home that they're using and we're going to talk about what is in there you know, if you have a bottled a bottled nutrient, let's say advanced nutrients, right, or something like that, that's uh, 96% water and it has a little bit of diammonium phosphate, some magnesium sulfate and potassium sulfate in it, well, you can buy all those things in bulk and, and, and save yourself on shipping a bunch of water and getting ripped off. You know, it's you're being overcharged and then you're being taxed for shipping. And so it's, it's, it's really important for – any person who's cultivating at home to understand what the product is that they're using. And if they're using X product that has this, this, and this, and this in it, know individually what these components are used for and what what benefits they have. And, and then figure out, hey, can I figure out how to apply this single element itself? Like if something has bone meal and crab meal and Epsom salt and gypsum and humic and fulvic acids and all this other stuff and they're jacked up the price way high because they blended it – when you, you know, you have to look at that. You have to be able to, to distinguish what is in the products that you're using and figure out if you could do it more cost effective or if you're being, you know, charged extra money just because there's a fancy logo on it. A lot of people fall into the trap of buying more than what they need and really, yeah, they're spending more money than they need to. And, um, they could be spending their money elsewhere. And it's also one of the reasons why I do package up these amendments individually for people and there is a surplus on that because it costs labor and packaging and all that other stuff but we also supply bulk and 50 pound so that way if you're a farm or if you're if you need to get these things in larger quantities you don't you're not spending the money the extra money to have it packaged and the labor associated with that so you can buy it all at the wholesale price which is way more cost affordable i mean when you go and buy a 50 pound bag of epsom salt for 25 bucks I mean, bam, that's money. You know, you can buy a 50-pound bag of gypsum for like 17, 18 bucks in most cases, you know. So if you have a provider, someone that's local to you that has all those things, it's just much more cost effective and it's much more sensible from a business perspective. That makes sense. So let's uh, let's wrap things up now. Tell us, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Yep. So uh, you can find me on social media. I have two profiles um, and a backup account, actually. Uh, so rust.brandon, R-U-S-T dot B-R-A-N-D-O-N. I am shadow banned, so you have to type that out. And then also Bokashi Earthworks, which is B-O-K-A-S-H-I Earthworks, all one word. And that's uh, on Instagram. We also have the website, which is www.bokashieearthworks.com, where we provide things like seeds, 
We have uh, biostimulants, amino acids, all the amendments that we talked about. We um, also sell bulk soils, uh, amendments, all that other stuff. So if, if it's not listed on the website, um, you can just inquire through email uh, about pricing and all that other stuff. And then our Patreon. Um, because of the censorship on social media, and we're seeing that right now in the news, congressional hearings, all that other stuff, it's been, uh, it's been difficult to really reach a lot of the people that, that are following. Um, so we are off platforming. You know, we're building up our, our own platforms by doing podcasts with great, with other great content creators like yourself. Um, we'll ha we have our own Patreon where we'll actually organize all of that content, and then we have exclusive content. Uh, we have live educational presentations. Uh, for instance, we're doing uh, something similar to what we're doing today. We're going to be more in depth. We're going to have all the amendments on hand. People can look at them, feel feel them, uh, and that's going to be in class, in person, in Oklahoma City. So we have those. Uh, those will be live streamed on the Patreon, and then slowly released over the course of the next several months on YouTube and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a lot of moving parts, a lot of things that we got going on, but uh, we're, we're working hard. I'm working hard to make it all happen, come together. Awesome. Well, this has been another informative episode. Brandon, I appreciate you coming on here again and, and spilling your knowledge. This is going to be one that I'm going to have to watch over and over again in order to absorb all the information that you uh, revealed here today. So thank you so much for coming on. If you enjoyed this episode, click that thumbs up button. Also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast episode. I'd love for you to tune in to future episodes. All right, Brandon, I'll let you go for now. Uh, I'm pretty sure people are going to want a part three. <laughs> so uh, definitely welcome you back in the future and we can continue on this conversation. All right. You have a great rest of your day. I'll talk to everybody soon. Thanks. Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.